Roman numeral inefficiency would not be tolerated for long in a world enriching itself through commerce. With trade networks proliferating and productivity escalating in tandem, growing prospects of wealth creation incentivized merchants to become increasingly competitive, pushing them to always search for an edge over others. Computation and record keeping with a zero-based numeral system was qualitatively easier, quantitatively faster, and less prone to error. Despite Europe's resistance, this new numeral system simply could not be ignored. Like its distant progeny Bitcoin would later be, zero was an unstoppable idea whose time had come. Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor, and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money show. Today, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. Um, I'm going to be going through a written piece that I did back in March 2019 titled The Number Zero in Bitcoin. Um, This is my most popular written piece ever. Um... It's on, posted on Medium, also posted on my Substack. We'll link to everything in the show notes below. And my motivation for writing this piece was trying to answer a pretty difficult question, which is what makes Bitcoin different than all other crypto assets? Like, what is it about Bitcoin that is special or unique? Um, and this is a, a question that has a pretty complex answer, actually. Like, the, the, the to understand the answer itself you need to have um a conceptual grasp of some kind of esoteric things like path dependence network effects um things like this so in looking for a historical parallel or a historical analogy to the emergence of bitcoin and trying to describe why it's uh, why it's different, why it's unique, why it's very resilient to disruption from other competitive systems. Um, I stumbled across the story of the number zero, right, and and the and the Hindu Arabic numeral system that contains zero. And so there's a there's a history here, right? There's a history of how the number zero emerged. Um, what made it special, like why is it now universal, the universal numeral system we use in the world today. Um, I draw some parallels between that and kind of the nature of money. 
Um, and then I get into some speculations on Bitcoin, like why introducing a Bitcoin 2.0 would not be feasible. So this is kind of an experiment. I haven't done this before. What I'm going to do is read the entire piece, the entire essay. It's about a 40 minute read. And so basically in kind of an audiobook style, I'm just going to read the text as it is. And then in future episodes, I'll go back through the text and provide some commentary and color around the actual written piece. So for this episode, episode one of the number zero and Bitcoin series, I am just going to read straight through the entire text. Um, and then in episodes two and beyond, I'll go back and provide some commentary. So with that, I'm going to start the read. The number zero and Bitcoin. Satoshi gave the world Bitcoin, a true something for nothing. His discovery of absolute scarcity for money is an unstoppable idea that is changing the world tremendously, just like its digital ancestor, the number zero. Zero is special. Quote, In the history of culture, the discovery of zero will always stand out as one of the greatest single achievements of the human race. Unquote. Tobias Danzig, author of Number, The Language of Science. Many believe that Bitcoin is just one of thousands of crypto assets. This is true in the same way that the number zero is just one of an infinite series of numbers. In reality, Bitcoin is special, and so is zero. Each is an invention which led to a discovery that fundamentally reshaped its overarching system. For Bitcoin, that system is money, and for zero, it is mathematics. Since money and math are mankind's two universal languages, both Bitcoin and zero are critical constructs for civilization. For most of history, mankind had no concept of zero. An understanding of it is not innate in us. A symbol for it had to be invented and continuously taught to successive generations. Zero is an abstract conception and is not discernible in the physical world. No one goes shopping for zero apples. To better understand this, we will walk down a winding path covering more than 4,000 years of human history that led to zero becoming part of the empirical bedrock of modernity. Numerals, which are symbols for numbers, are the greatest abstractions ever invented by mankind. Virtually everything we interact with is best grasped in numerical, quantifiable, or digital form. Math, the language of numerals, originally developed from a practical desire to count things whether it was the amount of fish in the daily catch or the days since the last full moon. Many ancient civilizations developed rudimentary numeral systems. In 2000 BCE, the Babylonians, who failed to conceptualize zero, used two symbols in different arrangements to create unique numerals between 1 and 60. And here I share an image of the Babylonian cuneiform Um, with the caption. Babylonian cuneiform was a relatively inefficient numeral system. Notice how many more written strokes are necessary for each number symbol, and calculation using it was even more cumbersome. So the point being, Babylonian cuneiform was a relatively inefficient numeral system compared to the Hindu-Arabic numeral system that we'll get into shortly. Vestiges of the base 60 Babylonian cuneiform system still exist today. There are 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, and six sets of 60 degrees in a circle. But this ancient system lacked a zero, which severely limited its usefulness. Ancient Greeks and Mayans developed their own numeral systems, each of which contained rough conceptions of zero. However, the first explicit and arithmetic use of zero came from ancient Indian and Cambodian cultures. They created a system with nine number symbols and a small dot used to mark the absence of a number, the original zero. 
This numeral system would eventually evolve into the one we use today. And now I show two images. Um, one is the ancient Bakshali manuscript, which shows the single dot uh, used as the original zero. And the caption reads, the first known written zero from the Bakshali manuscript, which contains pages dating back to the third and fourth centuries AD. And then I show another image, which is uh, an artifact called K127, and the caption reads, Inscription K127 bears the earliest zero ever discovered. Dated back from the 7th century, it was discovered in the night it was discovered in the 19th century in Cambodia. So these are both examples of uh, early instances of the number or the numeral zero actually being written down and used in a mathematical system. In the 7th century, the Indian mathematician Brahmagupta developed terms for zero in addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, although he struggled a bit with the latter, as would thinkers for many centuries to come. As the discipline of mathematics matured in India, it was passed through trade networks eastward into China and westward into Islamic and Arabic cultures. It was this western advance of zero which ultimately led to the inception of the Hindu-Arabic numeral system the most common means of symbolic number representation in the world today. And in the next image, I show um, just a brief lineage or, or genealogy, if you will, of numeral systems. It starts with the Brahmi numerals, which became, uh, which were the predecessors to the Indian or the Gavalior numeral systems. These branched off into the West Arabic, the Sanskrit, Devanag Devanagari numeral systems and the East Arabic numeral systems, which are still used in Turkey today. And those um, gave way to 15th and 16th century numeral systems. So it just shows how numeral systems are kind of like a language. There's a, there's a tree, you know, it, it branches and forks over time. Um, and this is just tracing back the, the origin of the Hindu Arabic numeral system. The Economization of Math When zero reached Europe roughly 300 years later in the High Middle Ages, it was met with strong ideological resistance. Facing opposition from users of the well-established Roman numeral system, zero struggled to gain ground in Europe. People at the time were able to get by without zero, but little did they know, performing computation without zero was horribly inefficient. An apt analogy to keep in mind arises here. Both math and money are possible without zero and Bitcoin, respectively. However, both are tremendously more wasteful systems without these core elements. Consider the difficulty of doing arithmetic in Roman numerals. And in the next image I show what it looks like to perform addition on the two numbers 1223 adding it to 1104, uh, I, I show that arithmetic in Roman numerals. And, you know, if we do it with the Hindu Arabic numeral system, it's a very compact, tight calculation with very few pen strokes. Um, you know, you're adding numbers. If you get a double digit number, you carry the one, uh, just like you learned in, in elementary school. Well, with Roman numerals, um, Suffice it to say, it's much more complex and space-consuming, takes many more pen strokes. So it's just a much less efficient way of calculating, um, of performing addition in this case. And again, addition is one of the, basically one of the simplest forms of arithmetic. Division with Roman numerals was just an absolute nightmare. So in all of these uh, arithmetic areas, Hindu Arabic numerals were radically more efficient and useful than things like Roman numerals. And the caption reads, If you thought you were bad at arithmetic using numbers, just try doing it with letters. Calculation performed using the Hindu Arabic system is significantly more straightforward than with Roman numerals. And energy efficient systems have a tendency to win out in the long run. As we saw when the steam engine outcompeted animal sourced power, or when capitalism prevailed over socialism. 
another important point to remember for Bitcoin later. This example just shows the pains of addition. Multiplication and division were even more painstaking. As Amir D. Axel described in his book, Finding Zero, quote, The Hindu-Arabic numeral system allowed an immense economy of notation so that the same digit, for example 4, can be used to convey itself for 40, when followed by a zero, or 404, when written as 404, or 4000, when written as a 4, followed by three zeros. The power of the Hindu-Arabic numeral system is incomparable as it allows us to represent numbers efficiently and compactly, enabling us to perform complicated arithmetic, complicated arithmetic calculations that could not have been easily done before. Roman numeral inefficiency would not be tolerated for long in a world enriching itself through commerce. With trade networks proliferating and productivity escalating in tandem, growing prospects of wealth creation incentivized merchants to become increasingly competitive, pushing them to always search for an edge over others. Computation and record keeping with a zero-based numeral system was qualitatively easier, quantitatively faster, and less prone to error. Despite Europe's res resistance, this new numeral system simply could not be ignored. Like its distant progeny Bitcoin would later be, zero was an unstoppable idea whose time had come. And in the next image I show the famous quote by Victor Hugo, who wrote that, quote, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come, unquote. Functions of zero. Zero's first function is as a placeholder in our numeric system. For instance, notice the zero and the number 1104 in the equation above, which indicates the absence of value in the tens place. Without zero acting as a symbol of absence at this order of magnitude in 1104, the number could not be represented unambiguously. Without zero, is it 1104 or 114? Lacking zero detracted from a numeral system's capacity to maintain constancy of meaning as it scales. Inclusion of zero enables other digits to take on new meaning according to their position relative to it. In this way, zero let us perform calculation with less effort, whether it's pen strokes in a ledger, finger presses on a calculator, or mental gymnastics. Zero is a symbol for emptiness, which can be a highly useful quality. As Lao Tzu said, quote, we shape clay into a pot, but it is the emptiness inside that holds whatever we want." Unquote. More philosophically, zero is emblematic of the void, as Axel describes it. Quote, the void is everywhere and it moves around. It can stand for one truth when you write a number a certain way, no tens, for example and another kind of truth in another case. Say when you have no thousands in a number, unquote. Drawing analogies to the functions of money, zero is the store of value on which higher order of magnitude numerals, zero is the store of value on which higher order of magnitude numerals can scale. This is the reason we always prefer to see another zero at the end of our bank account or Bitcoin balance. In the same way, a sound economic store of value leads to increased savings, which undergirds investment and productivity growth, so too does a sound mathematical placeholder of value give us a numeral system capable of containing more meaning in less space and supporting calculations in less time both of which also foster productivity growth. Just as money is the medium through which capital is continuously cycled into places of optimal economic employment, zero gives other digits the ability to cycle, to be used again and again with different meanings for different purposes. 
Zero's second function is as a number in its own right. It is the midpoint between any positive number and its negative counterpart, like positive 2 and negative 2. Before the concept of zero, negative numbers were not used, as there was no conception of nothing as a number, much less, less than nothing. Brahmagupta inverted the positive number line to create negative numbers and placed a zero at the center, thus rounding out the numeral system we use today. Although negative numbers were written about in earlier times, like the Han Dynasty in China in 2002, in 206 BCE to 220 BCE, their use wasn't formalized before Brahmagupta, since they required the concept of zero to be properly defined and aligned. In a visual sense, negative numbers are a reflection of positive numbers cast across zero. And in the next image, I just show a simple number line that goes from negative 9 through negative 1 with a 0 at the center and then positive 1 through positive 9. And the caption reads, 0 is the center of gravity for our entire numeral system, just as money is central to any economic system. Interestingly, negative numbers were originally used to signify debts, well before the invention of double-entry accounting, which opted for debits and credits partly to avoid the use of negative numbers. In this way, zero is the medium of exchange between positive and negative domains of numbers. It is only possible to pass into or out of either territory by way of zero. By going below zero and conceptualizing negative numbers, many new and unusual yet extremely useful mathematical constructs come into being, including imaginary numbers, complex numbers, fractals, and advanced astrophysical equations. In the same way, the economic medium of exchange, money, leads to the acceleration of trade and innovation, so too does the mathematical medium of exchange, zero, lead to enhanced informational exchange and its associated development of civilizational advances. And the next image is a uh, is of the Mandelbrot set, which is one of the most famous fractal images um, originally discovered by Benoit Mandelbrot. Uh, it's a simple iterative function, and it creates this, this kind of gorgeous, uh, haunting, complex visualization. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, you can zoom into it at any scale, like basically you can zoom into it infinitely or zoom out infinitely and it's always different at every scale but it also looks self-similar like you see these little islands these little molecule islands that seem to repeat um, at different scales but they're always slightly different so it's really interesting caption reads the Mandelbrot set one of the most famous examples of a fractal a mind-bending mathematical structure formed with complex numbers that models the geometry of nature and its intrinsic complexity. One of the best known examples of mathematical beauty, this fractal exhibits infinite depth, breadth, and non-repeating self-similarity. Zero is a necessary prerequisite to such fractal modeling. Zero's third function is as a facilitator for fractions or ratios. For instance, the ancient Egyptians, whose numeral system lacked a zero, had an extremely cumbersome way of handling fractions. Instead of thinking of three-fourths as a ratio of three to four, as we do today, they saw it as the sum of one-half and one-fourth. The vast majority of Egyptian fractions were written as a sum of numbers, as one over n, where n is the counting number. These were called unit fractions. Without zero, long chains of unit fractions were necessary to handle larger and more complicated ratios. Many of us remember the pain of converting fractions from our school days. With zero, we can easily convert fractions to decimal form, like one half to 0 0.5, which obsoletes the need for complicated conversions when dealing with fractions. 
This is the unit of account function of zero. Prices expressed in money are just exchange ratios converted into a money-denominated price decimal. Instead of saying, this house cost 11 cars, we say, this house cost $440,000, which is equal to the price of 11 $40,000 cars. Money gives us the ability to better handle exchange ratios in the same way zero gives us the ability to better handle numeric ratios. Numbers are the ultimate level of objective abstraction. For example, the number three stands for the idea of threeness, a quality that can be ascribed to anything in the universe that comes in a trouble form. Equally, nine stands for the quality of nineness, shared by anything that is composed of nine parts. Numerals in math greatly enhanced interpersonal exchange of knowledge, which can be embodied in goods or services, as people can communicate about almost anything in the common language of numeracy. Money, then, is just the mathematized measure of capital available in the marketplace. It is the least common denominator among all economic goods and is necessarily the most liquid asset with the least mutable supply. It is used as a measuring system for the constantly shifting valuations of capital. This is why gold became money. It is the monetary metal with a supply that is most difficult to change. Ratios of money to capital, aka prices, are among the most important in the world, and ratios are a foundational element of being. Quote, In the beginning, there was the ratio and the ratio was with God, and the ratio was God, unquote. John 1.1, 1, 1. Uh, with an asterisk. The asterisk says, a more, quote-unquote, rational translation of Jesus' beloved disciple John. The Greek word for ratio was logos, which is also the term used for word. So logos translates into word or ratio, and that was a reinterpretation of John 1.1, 1, 1, replacing the word word with ratio. An ability to more efficiently handle ratios directly contributed to mankind's later development of rationality, a logic-based way of thinking at the root of major social movements such as the Renaissance, the Reformation, and the Enlightenment. To truly grasp the strange logic of zero, we must start with its point of origin, the philosophy from which it was born. Philosophy of Zero Quote, In the earliest age of the gods, existence was born from non-existence. Unquote. The Rig Veda Zero arose from the bizarre logic of the ancient East, Interestingly, the Buddha himself was a known mathematician. In early books about him, like the Lalita Vistara, he is said to be excellent in numeracy, a skill he uses to woo a certain princess. In Buddhism, the logical character of the phenomenological world is more complex than true or false. Quote, Anything is either true or not true, or both true and not true, or neither true nor not true. This is the Lord Buddha's teaching. Unquote. This is the tetralemma, or the four corners of the Katsukoti, the key to understanding the seeming strangeness of this ancient Eastern logic, is the concept of shunya a Hindi word meaning zero. It is derived from the Buddhist philosophical concept of sunyata or shunyata. The ultimate goal of meditation is the attainment of enlightenment or an ideal state of nirvana, which is equivalent to emptying oneself entirely of thought, desire, and worldly attachment. Achievement of this absolute emptiness is the state of being in shunyata, 
a philosophical concept closely related to the void. As the Buddhist writer Thich Nhat Hanh describes it, quote, The first door of liberation is emptiness, shunyata. Emptiness always means empty of something. Emptiness is the middle way between existent and non-existent. Reality goes beyond notions of being and non-being. True emptiness is called wondrous being because it goes beyond existence and non-existence. The concentration on emptiness is a way of staying in touch with life as it is, but it has to be practiced and not just talked about." Unquote. Or, as a Buddhist monk of ancient Wat's temple in Southeast Asia described the meditative experience of the void, quote, when we meditate, we count. We close our eyes and we are aware only of where we are at in the moment and nothing else. We count breathing in, one, and we count breathing out, two, and we go on this way. When we stop counting, that is the void, the number zero, emptiness, unquote. A direct experience of emptiness is achievable through meditation. It, in a true meditative state, the shunyata and the number zero are one and the same. Emptiness is the conduit between existence and non-existence. In the same way, zero is the door from positive to negative numbers, each being a perfect reflection of the other. Zero arose in the ancient East as the epitome of this deeply philosophical and experiential concept of absolute emptiness. Empirically, today, we, know, we now know that meditation benefits the brain in many ways. It seems, too, that its contribution to the discovery of zero helped forge an idea that would forever benefit mankind's collective intelligence, a sort of software upgrade to our global hive mind. Despite being discovered in a spiritual state, zero is a profoundly practical concept. Perhaps it is best understood as a fusion of philosophy and pragmatism. By traversing across a zero into the territory of negative numbers, we encounter the imaginary numbers, which have a base unit of the square root of negative one, denoted by the letter i. The number i is paradoxical. Consider the equation plus positive or negative x squared plus 1 equals 0. The only possible answers are positive, positive square root of negative 1, i, and negative square root of negative 1, which is negative i or i cubed. Ascending into a higher dimension, the equation positive or negative x cubed plus 1 equals 0 yields the possible answers of positive 1, or negative one. These answers continue to alternate between the real and the imaginary domains as their underlying formulae exponentiate higher. Visualizing them in the real and imaginary domains, we find a rotational axis centered on zero with orientations reminiscent of the tetralemma. One true, which is one, one not true, I, one both true and not true, negative one or i squared, and one neither true nor not true, negative i or i cubed. And in the next image, I show this rotational representation of uh, the tetralemma uh, that was derived really from Hindu Arabic numeral system, which led us to the discovery of imaginary numbers. Um, and it just shows how this calculation can be carried out on it, a number axis, essentially. Um, and the caption reads, zero is the fulcrum between real and imaginary number planes. Going through the gateway of zero into the realms of negative and imaginary numbers provides a more continuous form of logic when compared to the discrete either or logic commonly accredited to Aristotle and his followers. 
This framework is less black and white than the binary Aristotelian logic system, which was based on true or false, and provides many gradations of logicality, a more accurate map to the many shades of gray we find in nature. Continuous logic is insinuated throughout the world. For instance, someone may say she wasn't unattractive, meaning that her appeal was ambivalent, somewhere between attractive and unattractive. This perspective is often more realistic than a binary assessment of attractive or not attractive. Importantly, Zero gave us the concept of infinity, which was notably absent from the minds of ancient Greek logicians. The rotations around zero through the real and imaginary number axes can be mathematically scaled up into a three-dimensional model called the Riemann sphere. In this structure, zero and infinity are geometric reflections of one another and can transpose themselves in a flash of mathematical permutation. Always at the opposite pole of this three-dimensional mathematical interpretation of the tetralemma, we find zero's twin, infinity. And the next image is of the Riemann sphere, which is um, taking that rotational calculation between the real and imaginary number planes, and it kind of just jumps off the page into this sphere. And at the very highest, most pole of that sphere is infinity, and the base pole of the sphere is zero. And the caption reads, Scaling the real and imaginary number planes into the third dimension, we discover zero's twin, infinity. The twin polarities of zero and infinity are akin to yin and yang, as Charles Seif, author of Zero, Biography of a Dangerous Idea, describes them. Quote, Zero and infinity always looked suspiciously alike. Multiply zero by anything and you get zero. Multiply infinity by anything and you get infinity. Dividing a number by zero yields infinity. Dividing a number by infinity yields zero. Adding zero to a number leaves it unchanged. Adding a number to infinity leaves infinity unchanged. Unquote. In Eastern philosophy, the kinship of zero and infinity made sense. Only in a state of absolute nothingness can possibility become infinite. Buddhist logic insists that everything is endlessly intertwined, a vast causal network in which all is inexorably interlinked, such that no single thing can truly be considered independent, as having its own isolated, non-interdependent essence. In this view, interrelation is the sole source of substantiation. Fundamental to their teachings, this truth is what Buddhists call dependent co-origination, meaning that all things depend on one another. The only exception to this truth is nirvana, liberation from the endless cycles of reincarnation. In Buddhism, the only pathway to nirvana is through pure emptiness. The next image is a painting of the Buddha in meditation um, with many of his disciples around him also in meditation. The caption reads, Nirvana, the ultimate spiritual goal in Buddhism, is attained by entering the void in meditation. This is where zero was discovered. Some ancient Buddhist texts state, Quote, the truly absolute and the truly free must be nothingness, unquote. In this sense, the invention of zero was special. It can be considered the discovery of absolute nothingness, a latent quality of reality that was not previously presupposed in philosophy or systems of knowledge like mathematics its discovery would prove to be an emancipating force for mankind in that zero is foundational to the mathematized, software-enabled reality of convenience we inhabit today. Zero was liberation discovered deep in meditation, a remnant of truth found in close proximity to nirvana, a place where one encounters universal, 
unbounded, and infinite awareness, God's kingdom within us. To Buddhist, zero was a whisper from the universe, from Dharma, from God. Words always fail us in the domain of divinity. Paradoxically, zero would ultimately shatter the institution which built its power structure by monopolizing access to God. In finding footing in the void, mankind uncovered the deepest, soundest substrate on which to build a modern society. Zero would prove to be a critical piece of infrastructure that led to the interconnection of the world via telecommunications, which ushered in the gold standard and the digital age, Bitcoin's two key inceptors, many years later. Blazing a path forward, the twin conceptions of zero and infinity would ignite the Renaissance, the Reformation, and the Enlightenment all movements that mitigated the power of the Catholic Church as the dominant institution in the world and paved the way for the industrialized nation-state. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touchscreen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touchscreen. It's got a camera for air-gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI, UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian Chris Rock. This is insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. There's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> like, I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default, and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin. And for Trezor Suite users, you can make CoinJoins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. Power of the church falls to zero. The universe of the ancient Greeks was founded on the philosophical tenets of Pythagoras, Aristotle, and Ptolemy. Central to their conception of the cosmos was the precept that there was no void, no nothingness, no zero. Greeks, who had inherited their numbers from the geometry-loving Egyptians, made little distinction between shape and number. Even today, when we square a number, like x squared, this is equivalent to converting a line into a square and calculating its area. Pythagoreans were mystified by this connection between shapes and numbers, which explains why they didn't conceive of zero as a number at all. After all, what shape could represent nothingness? Ancient Greeks believed numbers had to be visible to be real, 
whereas ancient Indians perceived numbers as an intrinsic part of a latent, invisible reality separate from mankind's conception of them. The symbol of the Pythagorean cult was the pentagram, a five-pointed star. The sacred shape contained within it the key to their view of the universe, the golden ratio. Considered to be the most beautiful number, the golden ratio achieved is achieved by dividing a line such that the ratio of the small part to the large part is the same as the ratio of the large part to the whole. Such proportionality was found to be not only aesthetically pleasing, but also naturally occurring in a variety of forms, including nautilus shells, pineapples, and, centuries later, the double helix of DNA. Beauty this objectively pure was considered to be a window into the transcendent, a soul-sustaining quality. The golden ratio became widely used in art, music, and architecture. And the next image is um, shows the golden ratio, how it's encoded into the proportions of the Parthenon building, um, and also shows how the golden ratio is encoded into the proportions of a nautilus shell. Um, and the caption reads, a simple sequence of calculations converges on the golden ratio, the beautiful number bountiful in nature. Beauty of this caliber heavily influenced many domains, including architecture, as seen in the design of the Parthenon here. The golden ratio was also found in musical harmonics. When plucking, a string, when plucking a string instrument from its specified segments, musicians would create the perfect fifth, a dual resonance of notes said to be the most evocative musical relationship. Discordant tritones, on the other hand, were derided as the devil in music. Such harmony of music was considered to be one and the same with that of mathematics and the universe. In the Pythagorean finite view of the cosmos, later called the Aristotelian celestial spheres model, movements of planets and other heavenly bodies generated a symphonic harmony of the spheres, a celestial music that suffused the cosmic depths. From the perspective of Pythagoreans, all was number, meaning ratios ruled the universe. The golden ratio's seemingly supernatural connection to aesthetics, life, and the universe became a central tenet of Western civilization, and later, the Catholic Church, a.k.a. the Church. Zero posed a major threat to the conception of a finite universe. Dividing by zero is devastating to the framework of logic, and thus threatened the perfect order and integrity of a Pythagorean worldview. This was a serious problem for the church, which, after the fall of the Roman Empire, appeared as the dominant institution in Europe. To substantiate its dominion in the world, the church proffered itself as the gatekeeper to heaven. Anyone who crossed the church in any way could find themselves eternally barred from the holy gates. The church's claim to absolute sovereignty was critically dependent on the Pythagorean model. As the dominant institution over the earth, which was in their view the center of the universe, necessarily held dominion in God's universe. Standing as a symbol for both the void and the infinite, zero was heretical to the church. Centuries later, a similar dynamic would unfold in the discovery of absolute scarcity for money, which is, dissident, which is dissident to the dominion of the Fed, the false church of modernity. Ancient Greeks clung tightly to a worldview that did not tolerate zero or the infinite. Rejection of these crucial concepts proved to be their biggest failure, as it prevented the discovery of calculus, the mathematical machinery on which on which much of the physical sciences and thus the modern world are constructed. Core to their flawed belief system was the concept of the indivisible atom, the elementary particle which could not be subdivided ad infinitum, 
In their minds, there was no way beyond the micro-barrier of the atomic surface. In the same vein, they considered the universe a macrocosmic atom that was strictly bound by an outermost sphere of stars winking down towards the cosmic core, Earth. As above, so below. With nothing conceived to be above this stellar sphere and nothing below the atomic surface, there was no infinity and no void. And the next image, uh, I show an ancient uh, Greek drawing of this, uh, these celestial spheres that show kind of the outermost uh, sphere of stars and then the, the Earth at the center of the universe and it shows the planets and how they're arranged. Um, I get this is pre Copernicus, you know, pre uh, heliocentrism. Um, and the caption reads A finite universe with Earth at the center was the central tenet of ancient Greek philosophy and later of the Catholic Church's institutional dominion over the world. Aristotle, with later refinements by Ptolemy, Ptolemy would interpret this finite universe philosophically and in doing so form the ideological foundation for God's existence and the church's power on earth. In the Aristotelian conception of the universe, the force moving the stars which drove the motion of all elements below was the prime mover, God. This cascade of cosmic force from on high downward into the movements of mankind was considered the officially accepted interpretation of divine will. As Christianity swept through the West, the Church relied upon the explanatory power of this Aristotelian philosophy as proof of God's existence in their proselytizing efforts. Objecting to the Aristotelian doctrine was soon considered an objection to the existence of God and the power of the Church. Infinity was unavoidably actualized by the same Aristotelian logic which sought to deny it. By the 13th century, some bishops began calling assemblies to question the Aristotelian doctrines that went against the omnipotence of God. For example, the notion that God cannot move the heavens in a straight line because that would leave behind a vacuum. If the heavens moved linearly, then what was left in their wake? Through what substance were they moving? This implied either the existence of the void, the vacuum, or that God was not truly omnipotent as he could not move the heavens. Suddenly, Aristotelian philosophy started to break under its own weight, thereby eroding the premise of the church's power. Although the church would cling to Aristotle's views for a few more centuries, it fought heresy by forbidding certain books and burning certain Protestants alive. Zero marked the beginning of the end for this domineering and oppressive institution. An infinite universe meant there were at least a vast multitude of planets, many of which likely had their own populations and churches. Earth was no longer the center of the universe, so why should the church have universal dominion? In a grand ideological shift that foreshadowed the invention of Bitcoin centuries later, Zero became the idea that broke the church's grip on humanity, just as absolute scarcity of money is breaking the Fed's stranglehold on the world today. In an echo of history, us moderns can once again hear the discovery of nothing beginning to change everything. Zero was the smooth stone slung into the face of Goliath, a death stroke to the dominion of the church. Felled by an unstoppable idea, this oppressive institution's fall from grace would make way for the rise of the nation state, the dominant institution, the dominant institutional model in modernity. Zero, an ideological juggernaut, indoctrinated in the church's dogma. Christianity initially refused to accept zero, as it was linked to a primal fear of the void. Zero's inexorable connection to nothingness and chaos made it a fearsome concept in the eyes of most Christians at the time. But Zero's capacity to support honest weights and measures, 
a core biblical concept, would prove more important than the countermeasures of the church, and the invention of zero would later lead to the invention of the most infallible of weights and measures, the most honest money in history, Bitcoin. In a world being built on trade, merchants needed zero for its superior arithmetic utility. As Pierre Simon Laplace said, quote, Zero is a profound and important idea which appears so simple to us now that we ignore its true merit. But its very simplicity and the great ease which it lent to all computations put our arithmetic, put our arithmetic in the first rank of useful inventions, unquote. In the 13th century, academics like the renowned Italian mathematician Fibonacci began championing zero in their work, helping the Hindu Arabic system gain credibility in Europe. As trade began to flourish and generate unprecedented levels of wealth in the world, math moved from purely practical applications to ever more abstracted functions. As Alfred North Whitehead said, quote, the point about zero is that we do not need to use it in the operations of daily life. No one goes out to buy zero fish. It is, in a way, the most civilized of all the cardinals, and its use is only forced on us by the needs of cultivated modes of thought. Unquote. As Alfred North Whitehead said, quote, The point about zero is that we do not need to use it in the operations of daily life, no one goes out to buy zero fish. It is in a way the most civilized of all the cardinals, and its use is only forced on us by the needs of cultivated modes of thought. As our thinking became more sophisticated, so too did our demands on math. Tools like the abacus relied upon a set of sliding stones to help us keep track of amounts and perform calculation. An abacus was like an ancient calculator, and as the use of zero became popularized in Europe, competitions were held between users of the abacus, the abacist, and of the newly arrived Hindu Arabic numeral system, the algorist, to see who could solve complex calculations faster. With training, the algorist could readily outpace abacist in computation. Contests like these led to the demise of the abacus as a useful tool. However, it still left a lasting mark on our language. The words calculate, calculus, and calcium are all derived from the Latin word for pebble, calculus. In the next image, uh, I show an, an artist depiction of one of these contests between the abacist and the algorist. And the caption reads, The algorist competing against the abacist. Contests like these empirically proved the supremacy of a zero-based numeral system over others even when aided by ancient mathematical tools like the abacus. Before the Hindu-Arabic numerals, money counters had to use the abacus or a counting board to keep track of value flows. Germans called the counting board a Richenbank, which is why moneylenders came to be known as banks. Not only did banks use counting boards, but they also used tally sticks to keep track of lending activities. The monetary value of a loan was written on the side of a stick, and it was split in two pieces, with the lender keeping the larger piece, known as the stock, which is where we get the term stockholder. Then I show uh, in the next image a picture of that stick uh, broken in two pieces. And the caption reads, an ancient loan tracking device called a tally stick. The lender kept the larger portion, the stock, and became a stockholder in the bank that made the loan. Despite its superior utility for business, governments despised zero. In 1299, Florence banned the Hindu Arabic numeral system. As with many profound innovations, Zero faced vehement resistance from entrenched power structures that were threatened by its existence. Carrying on lawlessly, Italian merchants continued to use zero-based numeral system to use the zero-based numeral system, and even began using it to transmit encrypted messages. Zero was essential to these early encryption systems, which is why the word cipher, which originally meant zero, came to mean secret code. 
The criticality of zero to ancient encryption systems is yet another aspect of its contribution to Bitcoin's ancestral heritage. At the beginning of the Renaissance, the threat to zero, the threat zero would soon pose to the power of the church was not obvious. By then, zero had been adapted as an artistic tool to create the vanishing point, an acute place of infinite nothingness that used in many paintings that sparked the Renaissance in the visual arts. Drawings and paintings prior to the vanishing point appear flat and lifeless. Their imagery was mostly two-dimensional and unrealistic. Even the best artists couldn't capture realism without the use of zero. And the next image, uh, I show a piece of this pre-Renaissance art. It's very flat, two-dimensional, and lifeless. Um, and the caption reads, Pre-Renaissance art. Still better than a banana duct-taped to a canvas. A little fiat art joke there. With the concept of zero, artists could, still, artists could create a zero-dimension point in their work that was infinitely far from the viewer and into which all objects in the painting visually collapsed. As objects appear to recede from the viewer into the distance, they become ever more compressed into the dimensionlessness of the vanishing point before finally disappearing. Just as it does today, art had a strong influence on people's perceptions. Eventually, Nicholas of Cusa, a cardinal of the church, declared, Terra non es centra mundi, which meant the earth is not the center of the universe. This declaration would later lead to Copernicus, to Copernicus proving heliocentrism, the spark that ignited the Reformation and later the Age of Enlightenment. And in the next image, I show a piece of art using the vanishing point. It's much more realistic. It's much, uh, much more like how we see the world. When we see things off in the distance, they're small. Things that are close are large. And there's a continuity between uh, the two, two scales of that scope. And in the caption, I wrote, By adding the vanishing point, a visual conception of zero... To drawings and paintings, art gained the realistic qualities of depth, breadth, and spatial proportion. A dangerous, heretical, and revolutionary idea had been planted by Zero and its visual incarnation, the vanishing point. At this point of infinite distance, the concept of Zero was captured visually, and space was made infinite. As Sif describes it. Quote, it was no coincidence that zero and infinity are linked in the vanishing point. Just as multiplying by zero causes the number line to collapse into a point, the vanishing point has caused most of the universe to sit in a tiny dot. This is a singularity, a concept that became very important later in the history of science. But at this early stage, mathematicians knew little more than the artist's about the properties of zero. Unquote. The purpose of the artist is to mythologize the present. This is evident in much of the consumerist trash art produced in our current fiat currency fueled world. Renaissance artists, who are often also mathematicians, true Renaissance men, worked assiduously in line with this purpose as the vanishing point became an increasingly popular element of art in lockstep with Zero's proliferation across the world. Indeed, art accelerated the propulsion of Zero across the mindscape of mankind. Modernity, the age of zeros, the age of ones and zeros. Eventually, Zero became the cornerstone of calculus, an innovative system of mathematics that enabled people to contend with ever smaller units approaching zero, but cunningly avoided the, tra avoided the logic trap of having to divide by zero. This new system gave mankind a myriad new ways to comprehend and grasp his surroundings. Diverse disciplines such as chemistry, 
engineering, and physics all depend on calculus to fulfill their functions in the world today. In the next image, um, I give, it's a two-dimensional depiction um, of like a, an infinite sided shape, something that curls back on itself, and it's got um, some mathematical lines pouring through it. It's just kind of like a, kind of like a abstract um, dimensional representation of the number zero, it's just like a ring, but if you fall on one side, it goes around infinitely, so it's kind of cool. And in the caption I wrote, Calculus enables us to make symphonic arrangements of matter in precise accordance with our imaginations. This mathematical study of continuous change is fundamental to all physical sciences. Zero serves as the source waters of many technological breakthroughs, some of which would flow together into the most important invention in history, Bitcoin. Zero punched a hole and created a vacuum in the framework of mathematics and shattered Aristotelian philosophy, on which the power of the church was premised. Today, Bitcoin is punching a hole and creating a vacuum in the market for money. It is killing Keynesian economics, which is the propagandistic power base of the nation-state, along with its apparatus of theft, the central bank. In modernity, the zero has become a celebrated tool in our mathematical arsenal. As the binary numer numerical system now forms the foundation of modern computer programming, zero was essential to the development of digital tools like the personal computer, the internet, and Bitcoin. Amazingly, all modern miracles made possible by digital technologies can be traced back to the invention of a figure for numeric nothingness by an ancient Indian mathematici mathematician. Brahmagupta gave the world a real something for nothing, a generosity Satoshi would emulate several centuries later. As Axel says, quote, Numbers are our greatest invention, and zero is the capstone of the whole system. Unquote. A composition of countless zeros and ones, binary code led to the proliferation and standardization of communications protocols, including those embodied in the Internet Protocol Suite. As people freely experimented with these new tools, they organized themselves around the most useful protocols, like HTTP, TCPIP, etc. Ossification of digital communication standards provided the substrate upon which new societal utilities like email, ride-sharing, and mobile computing, were built. Latest and arguably the greatest among these digital innovations is the uninflatable, unconfiscatable, and unstoppable money called Bitcoin. A common misconception of Bitcoin is that it is just one of thousands of crypto assets in the world today. One may be forgiven for this misunderstanding, as our world today is home to many national currencies. But all these currencies began as warehouse receipts for the same type of thing, namely monetary metal, usually gold. Today, national currencies are not redeemable for gold and are instead liquid equity units in a pyramid scheme called fiat currency, a hierarchy of thievery built on top of the freely selected money of the world, gold, which their issuers, central banks, hoard to manipulate its price, insulate their inferior fiat currencies from competitive threats, and perpetually, perpetually extract wealth from those lower down the pyramid. Given this confusion, many mistakenly believe that Bitcoin could be disrupted by any one of thousands of alternative crypto assets in the marketplace today. This is understandable as the reasons that make Bitcoin different are not part of a common parlance and are relatively difficult to understand. Even Ray Dalio, the greatest hedge fund manager in history, said that he believes Bitcoin could be disrupted by a competitor in the same way that iPhone disrupted BlackBerry. However, disruption of Bitcoin is extremely unlikely. Bitcoin is a path-dependent, one-time invention. 
Its critical breakthrough is the discovery of absolute scarcity, a monetary property never before and never again achievable by mankind. Like the invention of zero, which led to the discovery of nothing as something in mathematics and other domains, Bitcoin is the catalyst of a worldwide paradigmatic phase change, which some have started calling the Great Awakening. What numeral is to number and zero is to the void for mathematics, Bitcoin is to absolute scarcity for money. Each is a symbol that allows mankind to apprehend a latent reality. In the case of money, time. More than just a new monetary technology, Bitcoin is an entirely new economic paradigm, an uncompromisable base money protocol for a global, digital, non-state economy. To better understand the profundity of this, we first need to understand the nature of path dependence. The path dependence of Bitcoin. Path dependence is the sensitivity of an outcome to the order of events that led to it. In the broadest sense, it means history has inertia. I then show an image um, from a website called whatdoesnotchange.com, and it just sort of shows sort of shows how path dependence works and has some um, some written elements around the visuals. And um, it's an example, in this case, it's an example of how sociopolitical domain influences the development of the technical domain. Path dependence entails that the sequence of events matters as much as the events themselves. As a simple example, you get a dramatically different result if you shower and then dry yourself off versus if you dry yourself off first and then shower. Path dependence is especially prevalent in complex systems due to their high interconnectivity and numerous, often unforeseeable, interdependencies. Once started down a particular pathway, breaking away from its sociopolitical inertia can become impossible. For instance, imagine if the world tried to standardize to a different size of electrical outlet. Consumers, manufacturers, and suppliers would all resist this costly change unless there was a gigantic prospective gain. To coordinate this shift in standardization would require either a dramatically more efficient technology, a pool method by which people stand to benefit, or imposing or an imposing organization to force the change, a push method in which people would be forced to change in the face of some threat. Path dependence is why occurrences in the socio-political domain often influence developments in the technical. U.S. citizens saw path-dependent pushback firsthand when their, government when their government made a failed attempt to switch to the metric system back in the 1970s. Bitcoin was launched into the world as a one-of-a-kind technology a non-state digital money that is issued on a perfectly fixed, diminishing, and predictable schedule. It was strategically released into the wild, into an online group of cryptographers, at a time when no comparative technology existed. Bitcoin's organic adoption path and mining network expansion are a non-repeatable sequence of events. As a thought experiment, consider that if a new Bitcoin was launched today, it would exhibit weak chain security early on, as its mining network and hash rate would have to start from scratch. Today, in a world that is aware of Bitcoin, this new Bitcoin with comparatively weak chain security would inevitably be attacked, whether these were incumbent projects seeking to defend their head start, international banking cartels, or even nation states. The next image I show a chart of Bitcoin's hash rate and how much it's been growing over time. And the caption reads, Bitcoin's head start and hash rate is seemingly insurmountable. Path dependence protects Bitcoin from disruption as the organic sequence of events which led to its release 
and assimilation into the marketplace cannot be replicated. Further, Bitcoin's money supply is absolutely scarce, a totally unique and one-time discovery for money. Even if new Bitcoin was released with an absolutely scarce money supply, its holders would be incentivized to hold the money with the greatest liquidity, network effects, and chain security. This would cause them to dump new Bitcoin for the original Bitcoin. More realistically, instead of launching new Bitcoin, those seeking to compete with Bitcoin would take a social contract attack vector by initiating a hard fork. An attempt like this was already made with the Bitcoin Cash fork, which tried to increase block sizes to ostensibly improve its utility for payments. This chain fork was an abject failure and a real-world reinforcement of the importance of Bitcoin's path-dependent emergence. In the next image, I show a price chart of Bitcoin Cash, denominated in Bitcoin, and it basically shows it from launch through uh, the time of writing, and it has just collapsed, um, which indicates that Bitcoin was basically outcompeting Bitcoin Cash. In the caption, I wrote, Bitcoin Cash is considering a rebrand to Bitcoin Crash. Continuing our thought experiment, even if new Bitcoin featured a diminishing money supply, in other words, a deflationary monetary policy, how would its rate of money supply decay, or deflation, be determined? By what mechanism would its beneficiaries be selected? As market participants, nodes, and miners jockeyed for position to maximize their accrual of economic benefit from the deflationary monetary policy, forks would ensue that would diminish the liquidity, network effects, and chain security for new Bitcoin, causing everyone to eventually pile back into the original Bitcoin, just like they did in the wake of Bitcoin Cash's failure. Path dependence ensures that those who try to game Bitcoin get burned. Reinforced by four-sided network effects, it makes Bitcoin's first mover advantage seemingly insurmountable. The idea of absolute monetary scarcity goes against the wishes of entrenched power structures, like the Fed. Like Zero, once an idea whose time has come is released into the world, it is nearly impossible to put the proverbial genie back in the bottle. After all, unstoppable ideas are independent life forms. In the next image, I show a quote from Carl Jung, who said that, quote, people don't have ideas, ideas have people, unquote. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Bitcoin Conference 2023. This three-day event will be held May 18th through 20th in Miami Beach. Uh, this is going to be the biggest event of the year, as it always is. And the past two years in Miami have simply been amazing. Uh, day one's industry day. Days two and three are going to be open to general admission. And I'd say this is a great place to go and network with Bitcoiners or even look for a job. Uh, just a really all-around great experience. It's a fantastic speaker lineup including Michael Saylor, Zoltan Pozar, Lynn Alden, Alex Gladstein, many others. And last year, we did a 10 million sats giveaway for this event, and we're going to do it again this year. So to get discounted tickets and enter for a chance to win 10 million sats, go to b.tc slash conference and use code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. 
finite and infinite games. Macroeconomics is essentially the set of games played globally to satisfy the demands of mankind, which are infinite, within the bounds of his time, which is strictly finite. In these games, scores are tracked in monetary terms. Using lingo from the groundbreaking book fin Finite and Infinite Games, there are two types of economic games. Unfree or centrally planned markets are theatrical, meaning that they are performed in accordance with a predetermined script that often entails dutifulness and a disregard for humanity. The atrocities committed in Soviet Russia are exemplary of the consequences of a theatrical economic system. On the other hand, free markets are dramatic, meaning that they are enacted in the present according to consensual and adaptable boundaries. Software development is a good example of a dramatic market, as entrepreneurs are free to adopt the rules, tools, and protocols that best serve customers. Simply, theatrical games are governed by imposed rules, they are based on tyranny, whereas rule sets from dramatic whereas rule sets for dramatic games are voluntarily adopted based on individual sovereignty. From a moral perspective, sovereignty is always superior to tyranny. And from a practical perspective, tyrannies are less energy efficient than free markets because they require tyrants to expend resources enforcing compliance with their imposed rule sets and protecting their turf. Voluntary games, like those of free market capitalism, outcompete involuntary games, like those of centrally planned socialism, as they do not accrue these enforcement and protection costs. Hence the reason capitalism or freedom outcompetes socialism or slavery in the long run. Since interpersonal interdependency is at the heart of the comparative advantage and division of labor dynamics that drive the value proposition of economic cooperation and competition, we can say that money is an infinite game, meaning that its purpose is not to win, but rather to continue to play. After all, if one player has all the money, the game ends, like the game of Monopoly. In this sense, Bitcoin's terminal money supply growth or inflation rate of absolute zero is the ultimate monetary shelling point, a game-theoretic focal point that people tend to choose in an adversarial game. In game theory, a game is any situation where there can be winners or losers. A strategy is a decision-making process, and the shelling point is the default strategy for games in which the players cannot fully trust one another, like money. In the next image I show like a visual representation of the shelling point, and the caption I write, Among many spheres of competing interpersonal interest, scarcity is the shelling point of money. Economic actors are incentivized to choose the money that best holds its value across time, is most widely accepted, and most clearly conveys market pricing information. All three of these qualities are rooted in scarcity. Resistance to inflation ensures that money retains its value and ability to accurately price capital across time, which leads to its use as an exchange medium. For these reasons, holding the scarcest money is the most energy efficient strategy a player can employ which makes the absolute scarcity of Bitcoin an irrefutable shelling point, a singular, unshakable motif in games played for money. A distant digital descendant of zero, the invention of Bitcoin represents the discovery of absolute scarcity for money, an idea as equally unstoppable. Similar to the discovery of absolute nothingness symbolized by zero, the discovery of absolutely scarce money symbolized by Bitcoin is special. Gold became money because out of the monetary metals it had the most inelastic or relatively scarce money supply, 
meaning that no matter how much time was allocated towards gold production, its supply increased the least. Since its supply increased at the slowest and most predictable rate, gold was favored for storing value and pricing things, which encouraged people to voluntarily adopt it, thus making it the dominant money on the free market. Before Bitcoin, gold was the world's monetary shelling point because it made trade easier in a manner that minimized the need to trust other players. Like its digital ancestor, Zero, Bitcoin is an invention that radically, exchange, that radically enhances exchange efficiency by purifying informational transmissions. For Zero, this meant instilling more meaning per proximate digit for Bitcoin, this means generating more salience per price signal. In the game of money, the objective has always been to hold the most relatively scarce monetary metal, gold. Now, the goal is to occupy the most territory on the absolutely scarce monetary network called Bitcoin. A new epoch for money. Historically, precious metals were the best monetary technologies in terms of money's five critical traits. Divisibility, durability, portability, recognizability, and scarcity. Among the monetary metals, gold was relatively the most scarce and therefore it outcompeted others in the marketplace as it was a more sound store of value. In the ascension of gold as money, it was as if free market dynamics were trying to zero in on a sufficiently divisible, durable, portable, and recognizable monetary technology that was also absolutely scarce. Strong arguments for this may be found by studying the euro-dollar system. Free markets are distributed computing systems that zero in on the most useful prices and technologies based on the prevailing demands of people and the available supplies of capital. They constantly assimilate all of mankind's intersubjective perspectives on the world within the bounds of objective reality to produce our best approximations of truth. In this context, verifiable scarcity is the best proxy for the truthfulness of money, assurance that it will not be debased over time. As a pre-Bitcoin thought experiment, had a new gold been discovered in the Earth's crust, assuming it was mostly distributed evenly across the surface and was exactly comparable to gold in terms of these five monetary traits, with the exception that it was more scarce, free market dynamics would have led to its selection as money as it would be that much closer to absolute scarcity making it a better means of storing value and propagating price signals. Seen this way, gold as a monetary technology was the closest the free market could come to absolutely scarce money before it was discovered in its only possible form, digital. The supply of any physical thing can only be limited by the time necessary to procure it. If we could flip a switch and force everyone on earth to make their sole occupation gold mining, the supply of gold would soon soar. Unlike Bitcoin, no physical form of money could possibly guarantee a permanently fixed supply. So far as we know, absolute scarcity can only be digital. Digitization is advantageous across all five traits of money. Since Bitcoin is just information, relative to other monetary technologies, we can say its divisibility is supreme, as information can be infinitely subdivided and recombined at near zero cost, like numbers. Its durability is supreme, as information does not decompose. Books can outlast empires. Its portability is supreme, as information can move at the speed of light thanks to telecommunications. And its recognizability is supreme as information is the most objectively discernible substance in the universe, like the written word. Finally, and most critically, since Bitcoin algorithmically and thermodynamically enforces an absolutely scarce money supply, we can say that its scarcity is infinite, as scarce as time 
the substance money is intended to tokenize in the first place. Taken in combination, these traits make absolutely scarce digital money seemingly indomitable in the marketplace. In the same way that the number zero enables our numeric system to scale and more easily perform calculation, so too does money give an economy the ability to socially scale by simplifying trade and economic calculation. Said simply, scarcity is essential to the utility of money, and a zero-growth terminal money supply represents perfect scarcity, which makes Bitcoin as near a perfect monetary technology as mankind has ever had. Absolute scarcity is a monumental monetary breakthrough. Since money is valued according to reflexivity, meaning that investor perceptions of its future exchangeability influence its presence valuation, its present valuation, Bitcoin's perfectly predictable and finite future supply underpins an unprecedented rate of expansion and market capitalization. The next image I show a tweet where I wrote that the pristine predictability of Bitcoin creates reflexivity without precedent. Few will understand this until it's too late. And in the caption I wrote, Bitcoin is truly unique, a perfectly scarce and predictably supplied money. In summary, the invention of Bitcoin represents the discovery of absolute scarcity or absolute irreproducibility, which occurred due to a particular sequence of idiosyncratic events that cannot be reproduced. Any attempt to introduce an absolutely scarce or diminishing supplied money into the world would likely collapse into Bitcoin, as we saw with the Bitcoin Cash fork. Absolute scarcity is a one-time discovery, just like heliocentrism or any other major scientific paradigm shift. In a world where Bitcoin already exists, a successful launch via a proof-of-work system is no longer possible due to path dependence. Yet another reason why Bitcoin cannot be replicated or disrupted by any other crypto asset using this consensus mechanism. At this point, it seems absolute scarcity for money is truly a one-time discovery that cannot be disrupted any more than the concept of zero can be disrupted. A true Bitcoin killer would necessitate an entirely new consensus mechanism and distribution model with an implementation overseen by an unprecedentedly organized group of human beings. Nothing to date has been conceived that could even come close to satisfying these requirements. In the same way that there has only ever been one analog gold, there is likely to only ever be one digital gold. For the same quantifiable reasons, a zero-based numeral system became a dominant mathematical protocol and capitalism outcompetes socialism, the absolute scarcity of Bitcoin's supply will continue outcompeting all other monetary protocols in its path to global dominance. Numbers are the fundamental abstractions which rule our world. Zero is the vanishing point of the mathematical landscape. In the realm of interpersonal competition and cooperation, money is the dominant abstraction which governs our behavior. Money arises naturally as the most tradable thing within a society. This includes exchanges with others and with our future selves. Scarcity is the trait of money that allows it to hold value across time, enabling us to trade it with our future selves for the foregone opportunity costs, the things we could have otherwise traded money for had we not decided to hold it. Scarce money accrues value as our productivity grows. For these reasons, the most scarce technology, which otherwise exhibits sufficient monetary traits, divisibility, durability, recognizability, portability, tends to become money. Said simply, the most relatively scarce money wins. In this sense, what zero is to math, absolute scarcity is to money. It is an astonishing discovery, a window into the void, just like its predecessor, Zero. The next image I show um, the rendering of a black hole from the movie Interstellar. And in the caption, I wrote, actual footage of Bitcoin devouring all fiat currencies.
Bitcoin is the global economic singularity, the ultimate monetary center of gravity, an exponential devourer of liquid value in the world economy, the epitome of time, and the zero point of money. Fiat currency always falls to zero. Zero has proven itself as the capstone of our numeral system by making it scalable, invertible, and easily convertible. In time, Bitcoin will prove itself as the most important network in, global economic, in the global economic system by increasing social scalability, causing an inversion of economic power, and converting culture into a realignment, into a realignment with natural law. Bitcoin will allow sovereignty to once again adhere at the individual level instead of being usurped at the institutional level as it is today. All thanks to its special forebear, Zero. The next image is a tweet that I sent back in March 2020, and I wrote that Zero is special. 0% interest rates, 0% reserve requirements, 0% bank accountability, sorry, 0% central bank accountability. The only answer is the only money with a 0% terminal inflation rate, Bitcoin. Central planning in the market for money, aka monetary socialism, is dying. This tyrannical financial hierarchy has increased worldwide wealth disparities, funded perpetual warfare, and plundered entire commonwealths to bail out failing institutions. A reversion to the free market for money is the only way to heal the devastation it has wrought over the past 100 plus years. Unlike central bankers who are fallible human beings that give in to political pressure to pillage value from people by printing money, Bitcoin's monetary policy does not bend for anyone. It gives zero fucks. And in a world where central banks can just add zeros to steal your wealth, people's only hope is a zero fucks money that cannot be confiscated, inflated, or stopped. The next image, I show a tweet by Jason Williams. And he writes, a trillion really isn't that big a number anymore. In the next image, I show a tweet by Jason Williams, who wrote, A trillion really isn't that big a number anymore, especially when the Fed can just add zeros to a spreadsheet and make magic helicopter Fed money appear. Here's a quick guide to the zero adding QE steal your wealth game. And he shows a chart of numbers and um, how many zeros they have after them. So a 10 has one zero, 100 has two zeros, 1,000 has three zeros, so on and so forth. This goes up to, all the way up to a no, Novem Delcillion, which appears to have 20 zeros after it. Um, the point being, which I write in the caption, central banks literally just add zeros to steal vast swaths of societal wealth. Bitcoin was specifically designed as a countermeasure to expansionary monetary policies, aka wealth confiscation via inflation, by central bankers. Bitcoin is a true zero-to-one invention, an innovation that profoundly changes society instead of just introducing an incremental advancement. Bitcoin is ushering in a new paradigm for money, nation-states, and energy efficiency. Most importantly, it promises to break the cycle of criminality in which governments continuously privatize gains via seniorage and socialize losses via inflation. Time and time again, excessive inflation has torn societies apart, yet the lessons of history remain unlearned. Once again, here we are. The next image, I show uh, a meme that says, anyone who has ever opened a history book in their life Please, sweet baby Jesus, do anything to fix this economic crisis other than print more fucking money. I am fucking begging you. And then it shows the government's reaction, which is ha ha ha, money printer go brr. And in the caption, I said, thank you, internet, for all the hilarious yet meaningful memes. The Zero Hour. How much longer will monetary socialism remain an extant economic model? 
The countdown has already begun. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Liftoff. Rocket technicians always wait for zero before ignition. Countdowns always finalize at the zero hour. Oil price wars erupting in Eurasia, a global pandemic, an unprecedented expansionary monetary policy response, and another quadrennial Bitcoin inflation rate halving. 2020 is quickly becoming the zero hour for Bitcoin. Inflation rate and societal well-being are inversely related. The more reliably value can be stored across time, the more trust can be cultivated among market participants. When a money's roots to economic reality are severed, as happened when the peg to gold was broken and fiat currency was born, its supply inevitably trends towards infinity in hyperinflation, and the functioning of its underlying society deteriorates toward zero in economic collapse. An unstoppable free market alternative, Bitcoin is anchored to economic reality through proof-of-work energy expenditure and has an inflation rate predestined for zero, meaning that a society operating on a Bitcoin standard would stand to gain in virtually infinite ways. When Bitcoin's inflation rate finally reaches zero in the mid-22nd century, the measure of its soundness as a store of value, the stock-to-flow ratio, will become infinite. People that realize this and adopt it early will benefit disproportionately from the resultant mass wealth transfer. Zero and infinity are reciprocal. One divided by infinity equals zero, and one divided by zero equals infinity. In the same way, a society's well-being shrinks toward zero the more closely the inflation rate approaches infinity through the hyperinflation of fiat currency. Conversely, societal well-being can, in theory, be expanded towards infinity the more closely the inflation rate approaches zero through the absolute scarcity of Bitcoin. Remember, the Fed is now doing whatever it takes to make sure there is infinite cash in the banking system, meaning that its value will eventually fall to zero. In the next image, I link to a tweet by Marty Bent, which was a clip from one of the Fed um, employees. I forget the guy's name, but he was basically saying that the Fed has infinite cash. And if you have any understanding of what that means, um, that would be, you know, total purchasing power divided by infinity equals zero. So he's basically saying the value of the dollar will ultimately go to zero by claiming that the Fed has infinite cash. And the caption I wrote, market value and money always, market value of money always converges to its marginal cost of production. Infinite cash means dollars will inevitably become as valuable as the paper on which they are printed. Zero arose in the world as an unstoppable idea because its time had come. It broke the dominion of the church and put an end to its monopolization over access to knowledge and the gates to heaven. The resultant movement, the separation of church and state, reinvigorated self-sovereignty in the world, setting the individual firmly as the cornerstone of the state. Rising from the church's ashes came a nation-state model founded on sound property rights, rule of law, and free market money. Rising from the church's ashes came a nation-state model founded on sound property rights, rule of law, and free market money, aka hard money. With this new age came an unprecedented boom in scientific advancement, wealth creation, and worldwide well-being. In the same way, Bitcoin and its underlying discovery of absolute scarcity for money is an idea whose time has come. Emerging from the depths below first principles, Bitcoin is the zeroth principle for money. Bitcoin is shattering the siege of central banks on our financial sovereignty. It is invoking a new movement, the separation of money and state, as its revolutionary banner. And it is restoring natural law in a world ravaged by a mega wealth parasite, the Fed. Only unstoppable ideas can break otherwise immovable institutions. Zero brought the church to its knees, 
and Bitcoin is bringing the false church of the Fed into the sunlight of its long-awaited judgment day. Both Zero and Bitcoin are emblematic of the void, a realm of pure potentiality from which all things spring forth into being, the nothingness from which everything effervesces and into which all possibility finally collapses. Zero and Bitcoin are unstoppable ideas gifted to mankind, gestures made in the spirit of something for nothing. In a world run by central banks with zero accountability, a cabal that uses the specious prospects of infinite cash to promise us everything, thereby raising the specter of hyperinflation, nothingness may prove to be the greatest gift we could ever receive. Thank you, Brahmagupta and Satoshi Nakaboto, for your generosity. And I conclude with an image that says, everything is nothing, and it shows the number zero, and it says, with a twist, and it shows that zero twisted into an infinity sign. And that concludes the number zero and Bitcoin read through. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. And like I said, I'll now go back through the piece and offer um, some more ad hoc commentary. <laughs>